Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome. My name is uh, Scott Sillers. I am the chair of the Socrates Society Steering Committee. Um, I am a veteran of uh, 14 Socrates Society uh, events, so I like it, love it. Um, now, this was the part where I was going to stop talking and my wife was going to uh, say everything else, but she is not here, unfortunately, so you're stuck with me. But I want to I wanna welcome you all to the Socrates program, the annual dinner. Um, we have a great evening planned. We're going to have um, uh, Walter Isaacson, who is the Aspen Institute president, speak with Reed Hoffman on platform networks with social impact. And uh, as, you, as you all know, Reed is the uh, co-founder and executive chairman of LinkedIn. Um, we are also going to honor um, Jeff Rosen, who is the CEO of the National Constitution Center. And uh, he's in one of a veteran, awesome Socrates moderator. Um, I want to say, express my gratitude to all of you tonight um, for your support for the Socrates Society. Um, especially our patrons on our host committee. Uh, this evening we were able to raise $227,500, and so thank you, thank you very much. And this, is, this will help ensure the uh, security and growth of this important program. Uh, and now without further ado, I am going to introduce Elliot Gerson. Thank you, Scott, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I, too, would like you to welcome you all to the annual Socrates uh, dinner. Uh, please continue to enjoy your first course. Uh, you know, this is always an exciting and busy time of the year here in Aspen, but this Socrates event always plays a very special role amidst all the other things going on. Uh, we had our 11th Aspen Ideas Festival. It concluded just last week. Many of you, of course, so thank you. Uh, and uh, it was terrific. Uh, we have a hard challenge every year, beating expectations, but thanks to Kitty, who's here tonight, and her team, they, we always seem to manage. Uh, thank you, Kitty. <laughs> And also a shout out to Kitty too, because many of you don't realize what what was what Kitty did before the Ideas Festival, and it was Socrates. So it's it, <laughs> so there's no accident uh, that uh, she has been associated with two such extraordinary programs. So the Ideas Festival concluded, and then we have so many other things going on, and we're an increasingly global organization as well. As a matter of fact, Walter and Kathy and I just got back from Italy last night. That's why we were not with you at the opening dinner, for those of you who are actual Socrates participants. Uh, we had a program uh, in Venice with all of our overseas Aspens. We now have nine other Aspen Institutes and representatives of some of them are here uh, as participants in the Socrates program. And we also put on a program on food security, the critical, urgent problems about uh, lack of, of food equity uh, around the world at the Food Expo in Milan. And of course, we have so many policy programs meeting here all summer long, including some now and the Justice and Society program. So our campus is a buzz. But Socrates is special for many, many reasons. One, I think, is reflected just in the nature of this audience. I can't think of any other thing we do that's such a wonderful combination of people, uh, young people who have never before participated any, in anything at Aspen, and then uh, a family of people like Scott who have come back year after year after year, in some cases 14 or more years, to the Socrates program. And finally, of course, some of our dearest friends and donors and benefactors who make all of these programs possible. Uh, it's also very special tonight that we're able to welcome two extremely distinguished members of the Aspen family, uh, our honoree, uh, Jeff Rosen, uh, has been a very close friend of Aspen for many years, a close friend of many of us personally as well, uh, conducting many Socrates seminars, many programs at the Aspen Ideas Festival. Uh, we recognized his, his talent as not only a great legal scholar, but as one, is the, one of the nation's best 
explainers of legal issues and issues relating to justice and the Constitution, uh, writing extensively in, in journals and, and books. And once we recognized that great talent, it was no surprise that the Constitution Center in Philadelphia gobbled him up and now he's doing extraordinary work there. Uh, some of that work we hope very much to uh, collaborate with him uh, uh, of, with the Aspen Institute. And of course, uh, Reed Hoffman, uh, everyone knows, an extraordinarily successful uh, entrepreneur, a venture capitalist, an author, and also an Aspen Fellow. We think we have a very exciting evening planned. Uh, of course, we're celebrating uh, a program that's now over, now almost 20 years old, bringing young leaders together, increasingly from all over the world, to grapple with some of the most important issues of the day, and grapple with those issues in a Socratic dialogue moderated by experts in their field. It's a formula that works extraordinarily well and is now catching fire uh, literally around the world. Uh, and in addition, the Socrates program has proven to be an extraordinary entree or gateway to the broader Aspen Institute family of activities. Many Socrates alumni have gone on to become trustees, uh, Henry Crown Fellows, members of our Vanguard Society and our Society of Fellows, uh, participants and, and presenters at the Ideas Festival, uh, participants at the Action Forum, uh, and, and indeed contributors to some of our more than 30 policy programs. And we hope very much that those of you tonight who are here in your first Socrates program will see this as an invitation to stay close to the Institute, find other opportunities to be engaged because there are many of them. As I alluded to just a minute ago, uh, we are now at Socrates really a thriving international organization. Our first international venture, uh, we, we uh, anticipated what would develop several years later. Uh, we brought a Socrates seminar to Cuba. Uh, since then, we've gone to many other countries. Uh, this year, we're going to be going uh, to Ukraine. As a matter of fact, we have a representative here uh, of uh, an organization, Ukraine, that we've been involved with for now seven or eight years that we hope will actually become a full-fed, full-fledged Aspen Institute in Kyiv. Uh, we also uh, are, will be doing Socrates seminars in Mexico uh, and Spain, and uh, we hope as well that we will be doing one, I'm pretty sure we'll be doing one, uh, in, in Belgrade, and soon after that, probably in India and Japan. And for those of you who like the Socrates method and are enjoying yourselves either this year or have in the past, I'd urge you to consider trying one in another country because there are really very few ways where you can engage yourself intellectually and culturally on critical issues and at the same time make wonderful and often lifelong friends uh, from not only the country where the seminar is conducted but from among those who've come to that country from all over the world. Most important, we are enormously grateful to all of you here tonight who have made the Socrates program so successful. Uh, your financial support has made this program uh, what it is, and it is something that inspires young leaders. It encourages them to get more involved in the critical public issues of our day, in their communities, in their countries. Uh, and we have special thanks as well uh, for to a number of people who have generously contributed scholarship funds that make it possible for this program uh, to bring people here who otherwise would not be able to afford to, people who are doing amazing and extraordinary things, especially as social entrepreneurs all across this country and the world. Special thanks to Walter and Kathy Isaacson for establishing a scholarship for Teach for America uh, 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 alumni uh, from uh, uh, Walter's native New Orleans. I think we have three Teach for America fellows here, scholars here tonight. Uh, special thanks also to uh, Ricardo Salinas, who's not here today, was here last week. Uh, one of our newest trustees who's established the Ricardo Salinas scholarships. And I think we have nine Latino and Latina scholars here participating in Socrates due to the generosity of Ricardo Salinas. And finally, I'd like to thank Leonard Lauder for establishing the Bill Buttinger Scholarship 
to, sum, to support an annual scholar who's engaged in public service. This year's scholar is Dan Pabon, who is a state representative from our summer home state right here in Colorado. Finally, uh, on behalf of the Socrates program and the entire Aspen Institute, I would like to give a very special thanks to our dinner co-chairs, uh, Mona Williams and Scott Sillers, and of course, Lori, Laura and Gary Lauder. Uh, and I, a special thanks to Gary and Laura. Uh, I'm going to... I'm going to ask Gary and Lauder to come up in just a minute. I think most of you know that Gary and, Lauder, Gary and Laura founded this program. Uh, it was really their vision to bring young leaders to this campus to uh, participate and share in the magic of Aspen. And I really can't imagine that they could have thought uh, almost 20 years ago that this would have been as successful as it has been. And it's very much a testament to their uh, vision and energy and commitment that this is thriving as it is today. So with that, I would like to ask Laura and Gary to please come to the stage. Good evening, everyone. Wow. This is the Socrates family, the family that all of you represent. Raise your hand if you're a participant in a Socrates program this weekend. Wow. We have over 100 of all of you, and then well over 100 of everyone else. So we're even, and we love having every member of you. You're all part of the Socrates family, so thank you for being here. I also want to say a very special word that Walter, thank you, Elliot, thank you, Melissa, thank you. We couldn't have better leadership here at the Aspen Institute, and now we've added Jen, thank you, Dana, Dana, thank you. This is about leadership, and that's the kind of excellence in leadership that we have at the Institute at every level, and we are so appreciative. I also want to make a special mention of my father-in-law, my sweet father-in-law, who was a very generous benefactor this evening, who couldn't be here. He is recovering from knee surgery, but he is with us in spirit. And his wonderful wife, Judy, who is also a longtime Aspen friend, and we're so happy that they're together. Okay, on with the show. Uh, as Elliot mentioned, this is our 19th year. We've had over 5,000 young people go through the Socrates program over the last 19 years, which is unbelievable. But there's one particular moderator who exemplifies the kind of excellence, not just in leadership, but in excellence in intellect and in leading others to be passionate and care deeply about what we all are here for, which is understanding the, the most difficult tensions between civil society and the issues that we face in making sure that the world stays a safe place as well as a place that respects dignity and human rights. So I'm going to give it over to Gary. We're going to share this little toast to Jeff. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, Elliot. Um, so um, when talking about Jeff and his achievements, the hard part is deciding what not to say uh, for the sake of brevity, since there's so numerous and fascinating here are but a few in chronological order. So um, he was valedictorian of his high school, Dalton in New York. <laughs> he graduated summa cum laude from Harvard in, in both English and government, both of which he has made effective use. He was a Marshall Scholar at Oxford, where he got yet another degree, this time in philosophy, politics, and economics. Um, at Yale Law School, he was, uh, which in a harbinger of things to come, he got an award for having the best paper on the Bill of Rights. Um, and since then, he has been, inter alia, legal affairs editor of the New Republic, professor of GW University Law School, a senior fellow at Brookings, and a jolly good fellow at that, um, and a staff writer at The New Yorker, frequent contributor to The New York Times Magazine, Atlantic Monthly, National Public Radio, etc., etc., and author of five books, not counting his upcoming book, uh, Louis Brandeis, An Interpretive Biography. Um, and the list of his publications, speeches, and other honors is actually 31 pages long, single-spaced. Um, 
But what matters most to us only occupies a single sentence that reads, moderator for the Aspen Institute since 2000, conduct seminars and moderate panels for the Aspen Socrates Institute Society of Fellows and Ideas Festival on technology and constitution, privacy, free speech, and democracy, balancing liberty and security and religious freedom. So that does say it all, but it doesn't. Um, so um, <laughs> this is Laura's part. We met Jeff, gosh, it's been well over 15 years ago. And we were introduced by a mutual friend. And I was told, you know, you can't get much better than this. And I said, well, fantastic, let's see. Well, Jeff has now moderated for us over 11 times in places all over the world. You moderated our first seminar in Spain. And you were sending you off in other places as well. And as a result of these seminars, people come back. It's one of the most, the, the greatest level of recidivism that the Aspen Institute has ever seen. Um, and he's actually moderated uh, ten, of, uh, 10 of them for us already. So I, I'm just going to say a few other little things about Jeff, because Jeff is not just an extraordinary moderator, but he is also a very dear friend of ours. As a result of my passion and devotion to Jeff, I follow him around at every seminar he ever, he ever moderates. We became such dear friends that when he was thinking about moving from the current role that he had as a, as a, uh, as a professor at GW Law School and, and doing a lot of journalism work, he was actually offered a full-time 80-hour-a-week job, which the headhunter called and asked me, we're not sure if he can run a museum. Can he raise money? Can he manage staff? And I knew that as, a, as brilliant as Jeff is, he is also such a humble, warm, and devoted young man that I knew he could do all of those too. And so when he was hired by the National Constitution Center, I felt so, so blessed that he asked me to be on his board there as well. And I accepted immediately. And now I come to Philadelphia a lot more often, which is a special thing for me since our son Josh is about to start college there. So in that sense, he is a special part of our family. He's the most important person in Philadelphia to me until, jo until our son Josh gets there. So um, uh, he has a special gift for engaging participants in, uh, uh, in his moderating. And um, in particular, he magically makes everyone in the room sound uh, so much smarter with his uh, eloquent summations of what they just said. Um, <laughs> So, um, but in, in addition to some of the other background I gave you, um, and that's publicly known, we did a little digging for some other uh, not so public information. So, um, according to some anonymous sources, uh, he is extremely ticklish. He's an he he's an excellent pianist. Uh, he is extremely loyal, and he checks on elderly relatives regularly. Um, his biggest failure in life was that he got the Marshall Scholarship and not the Rhodes. Um, uh, uh, he has, uh, he has a crush on Justice Ginsburg. Uh, um, he, he studied with a Talmudic scholar. And uh, he wrote an edition of Let's Go Morocco and uh, brought home multiple cheap Moroccan carpets that were orange and green. <laughs> he is nodding, uh, for those who can't see. Um, he share, and he shares his Philadelphia apartment with another Washingtonian and Socrates moderator named Zeke Emanuel. Many of whom have seen you on him. Have seen many of you have seen him on this stage, and uh, for three years he came over to the house of his friend Neil Katyal to help him drink Neil's wine. And uh, since he never brought Neil any wine, he said, "I'm going to make it up to you. I'm going to introduce you to my sister." And uh, Neil did, in fact, marry his sister Joanna. And uh, we presume the wine debt is more than forgiven. Um, <laughs> And uh, Neil, his brother-in-law, is also a legal expert who has argued many cases at the Supreme Court. And so the two of them are considering creating a TV show named Brothers in Law. <laughs> so, um, and uh, another little known fact is that he, he loves Gilbert and Sullivan. And so in that spirit, give three cheers and give one more for Socrates' best moderator. Actually, this, this is, you're only up here for the hug. Um, the, the, and, and, and now, and now uh, there'll be a three-minute video. Okay. Thank you. Aspen has a 
special place in my heart because Aspen gave me my start and set me on the path that led me to the National Constitution Center. It was Laura and Gary Lauder's wonderful decision years and years ago to bring me in as a moderator for the Socrates program that kindled my great passion in life, which is to bring people of very different perspectives together for constitutional conversations. You have given us a comprehensive tour of your experiences with privacy and communication, the views of the people as a whole who, according to some studies, a few are less polarized and actually converge more on issues than not. And those Socrates discussions were what made me want to come to the National Constitution Center because this is the one place in the country that is a platform for bringing together all sides to discuss not political issues but constitutional issues and let people make up their own mind. So as soon as I came here, I decided to take that Aspen model and try to offer it as a model for civil constitutional dialogue and education for the nation. Through his involvement with the Aspen Ideas Festival, through our Socrates program, as a teacher on our Aspen X program we do with Khan Academy, and our, in his intimate involvement with our Justice and Society program, he brings passion and commitment to all that he does. Here's a guy who's a great constitutional scholar. He, he lives this stuff, right? He's making it a living document. And then here we have this experience of being able to go through and unpack those issues and see both sides through his guidance. We have shown that the bulk surveillance of the private data of American citizens without a warrant is not only ineffective, it's also unconstitutional. You can't give moral disapproval as a reason, and you said it was encouraging that even the, uh, the dissenters didn't try to say moral disapproval was a legitimate reason. So just to give in my Constitution Center style the arguments on both sides. <laughs> so thank you for both leading these conversations, leading us, and really providing some leadership for America. Jeff has lifted the Socrates program in so many ways over the last decade, and it's our pleasure to honor him this evening. Jeff Rosen is an important partner of the Institute, but more than that, he's a crucial thought leader for our country. This is a small token, <laughs> a small token of our appreciation. You know, at the, the good news is that we also have two beautiful glasses to go with this that you can share with Neil and your sister beautiful. in any time that you want to celebrate, and we would love to join you. So thank you so much for all you've done for Socrates, for the Aspen Institute, and indeed for America. And it'll look great with your Fiji water and Palm Wonderful in it. Um, okay, so uh, here is the mic, and um, who is next? Jeff is next, and we're going to eat dinner. Okay. Okay. Can I give you this lovely bowl? Hold that. Wonderful. <laughs> There is nothing more wonderful and meaningful than to be surrounded by your family. And Socrates is my family. Uh, Gary and Laura gave me my start 10 years ago and brought me here and included me in this spectacular institute. And this has really created the passion of my life, uh, becoming friends with all of you, working with you to have these amazing constitutional conversations uh, at Socrates and then at the Ideas Festival and then at the National Constitution Center and increasingly around the country and around the world is meaningful. And what I, well, I, sh I should say first of all, I, I will try not to go on uh, too long now. You've been seeing a lot of me this week and I think I've been moderating uh, so much. I was uh, jogging at Roaring Cork, uh, Creek this afternoon and I started to moderate the conversation of two joggers who were passing me. <laughs> But I, I want to say thank you, and I want to kind of earnestly tell you why I've concluded that the Socrates model is not only a wonderful way to spend a beautiful summer uh, week, but something really important for American democracy and really for uh, constitutional education across America. 
So I'm going to tell you uh, three things. First, why Socrates is so important. Second, why I'm trying to extend it at the National Constitution Center. And third, how I've learned from my hero, Justice Brandeis, that small-scale deliberation around a table with a group of people from different perspectives who are going to set aside their policy differences and try to converge on some kind of civic wisdom is really necessary for the survival of American democracy. So at Socrates, I think I've learned, as I did this morning in our great privacy and technology seminar where Jazz flew a drone on the terrace right where we just had drinks and demonstrated so dramatically how easy it is to track people from place to place, I learned the importance of respectful discourse where no one dominates, where everyone contributes. And I learned the hunger that people have for substance nowadays and for lifelong learning. We graduate from school, we are busy, but the opportunity to set aside our devices and our preconceptions, to meet people of different perspectives, and to deliberate respectfully is a model for the kind of deliberation that the framers of the Constitution thought was necessary. And that's why every year I learn more than I teach, and I just become more and more convinced of the importance of the entire enterprise. So that's why it's so wonderful to be a member of the Socrates family, and all of you who have just joined are going to have this great experience for a lifetime. And then, as Laura said, I had the incredible luck of being tapped to head this national treasure, the National Constitution Center. And I came in and I took the job because I saw it as an opportunity to do at the Constitution Center what I'd learned at Socrates, to bring together people from the left and the right and everywhere in between to debate not political issues but constitutional issues. So I was so excited to be able to convince the heads of the Federalist Society, the leading conservative lawyers organization in America, and the American Constitution Society, the leading liberal organization, to co-chair an advisory board and to produce the best interactive constitution on the web. And we're going to have top liberals and conservatives writing about every clause of the constitution, both what they agree about and what they disagree about. And I'm thrilled to share that the college board has just agreed to make this the centerpiece of the new AP history and government curriculum. And this is just an amazing interactive tool that we'll be able to add video and podcasts and Supreme Court cases. And our job, and I think this is your job as much as mine, because I'm a crusader for this kind of education, is to bring this tool not just to AP kids, but to every student in the country. And to really kindle in people of different backgrounds and different educational opportunities a passion for constitutional education. It is. It is important, and we have to do it together. And we're going to do this not only by creating this astonishing interactive constitution, but also by the series of panels and debates and symposia and podcasts that we're holding. In his wonderful introduction, um, Elliot said that we're going to do um, partnerships with the Aspen Institute and hold these panels in cities across America. At the Constitution Center, we already have our traveling town hall debates both with the Federalist Society and the Constitution Society, and with our great friends at Intelligence Squared. Bob Rosencrantz is here, and he deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Bob has created the best intelligent debate series in America. We have a special constitutional arm where we debate constitutional issues. Uh, Bob and I just had a dinner table version of it where I debated the pro side of the marriage equality case, and he deb d debated the dissent. And since he shifted more votes, he won. So congratulations <laughs> to Bob for that. But I think that these debates are, are going to really, like the Lincoln-Douglas debates, transform constitutional discourse. We are going to model for the country what it's like to present the best arguments on both sides and teach people that there are good arguments on both sides. We're doing this on these wonderful podcasts, which are getting 400,000 downloads a month. It just confirms the hunger for substance and for education and for getting people beyond their comfort zones, which is what we try to do at Socrates, to kind of challenge people to educate themselves. I was so thrilled that at the Society of Fellows seminar I moderated earlier this week, the homework assignment was go read a Supreme Court case. Read the majority opinion and read the concurrence and the dissents, and then tell us what you think. And lots of folks, I think, had not read a case through before, but they did, and they were kindled to it. They had interesting observations. They, not in a legalistic, but in a civic way, responded to it. These decisions are written for all of us as citizens, and it's just great to challenge people and to see them rise to the occasion. 
So that's the debate series. And then finally, there's this beautiful museum. You saw a shot of it. It's this palace on Independence Hall designed by I.M. Pei, right across from Independence Hall with the best constitutional views of America. We have one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights, rare copies of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And we're trying to bring school kids from across America to see these interactive exhibits and to be thrilled by the Constitution. Allow me, if you will, just one last beat on Justice Brandeis and Socrates. Um, and here I have to take out my notes because I'm going to quote from him. But I am finishing up this biography. Uh, it's going to be called Louis Brandeis, American Prophet. And it argues that Justice Brandeis, who served on the Supreme Court from 1916 to 1939, and the 100th anniversary of his confirmation hearings is next, next June, and that's when the book is going to come out on June 1st, I argue that he's the most important prophet of free speech and privacy in an age of technological change the most important critic of the curse of bigness in government and economics since Thomas Jefferson, who was his model, and finally the most important uh, Jew of the uh, 20th century because he, as the leader of the American Zionist movement, persuaded Woodrow Wilson to recognize the Jewish homeland for the state of Israel. But Brandeis has the most beautiful defense of the importance of the connection between free speech and deliberation in small groups and American democracy that's ever been written. And it's in his gorgeous opinion in the Whitney and California case. And here, if I can read it, uh, it is. Those who won our independence believed that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties, and that in its government, the deliberative forces should prevail over the arbitrary. They valued liberty both as an end and as a means. They believed liberty to be the secret of happiness and courage to be the secret of liberty. They believed that freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth. That without free speech and assembly, discussion would be futile. That with them, discussion affords ordinarily adequate protection against the dissemination of noxious doctrine, that the greatest menace to freedom is an inert people, that public discussion is a political duty, and that this should be a fundamental principle of American government. Wow, it is all there, and there are two influences on Brandeis in that extraordinary passage. The first is Jefferson. He quotes Jefferson's first inaugural, and Jefferson, in the first inaugural, in addition to his famous pay-in to bipartisanship, we are all Republicans, we are all Federalists, also talked about the necessity of public education, the reason Jefferson founded the University of Virginia and provided in the Virginia Bill of Rights for public education is because he believed that people had an obligation to develop their faculties. That was Brandeis's word. Brandeis and Jefferson thought, we all have faculties from passion at the bottom to reason at the top, and we have an obligation to develop our reason so that we can fully participate as citizens in democracy. And Brandeis's second influence, and this is so apt for the Socrates seminar, was a book by Alfred Zimmern called The Greek Commonwealth. Brandeis's ideal of democracy was the Periclean Athens, the age of Pericles and Socrates, who were both contemporaries in fifth century Athens. Uh, Socrates, uh, uh, born in uh, 560 uh, BCE, and uh, Pericles uh, coming up to power in, in uh, uh, 569. And here is what Zimmern talks about in the Greek Commonwealth. He has a definition of leisure that I think is really relevant to the Socrates seminar and that Brandeis thought was central to democracy. Uh, the Greeks believed that leisure was, um, uh, quoting Zimmern, the Greek word for unemployment is skoli, which means leisure, while for business he has no better word than ne the negative askoli, which means absence of leisure. The hours and weeks of unemployment he regards as the best and most natural part of his life. Leisure is the mo mother of art and contemplation, as necessity is the mother of technical devices we call invention. So for the Greeks and for Brandeis, leisure is time off from work, but it's not time to play video games. It's time to read uh, about uh, democracy, to read the newspapers, to educate yourself about public affairs so that you can fully participate in public deliberations. And that's why Brandeis, in a 4th of July address, J July 4th, 1915, 100 years ago, qu quotes uh, Zimmern on leisure and says, 
whether the education of the citizen in later years is to be given in classes or from the public platform or supplied through discussion in lodges and trade unions or is to be gained from reading of papers, periodicals, and books, in any case, freshness of mind is indispensable to its attainment. So for Brandeis, in other words, leisure is like a Socrates seminar. It, it really is an opportunity for people to gather in small groups, to set aside their politics, to set aside their, un, their employment and their daily work, and to earnestly deliberate toward political truth. This was not something frivolous. Brandeis's ideal was the Jewish garment workers that he met in a strike in 1910, and he was so impressed that during their leisure time, they would read the newspapers, they'd read Tolstoy and literature, and they could empathize with each other because they were able to listen. So I believe for all these reasons that the Socrates model, which was the model of Socrates, who would sit in the Agora and talk about moral issues and deliberate with people, was the model for Jefferson and is the model for Brandeis. And without this sort of lifelong public education, which has to begin with school kids, and we really do have an obligation to get this constitutional education to every kid in America, but then continues throughout life here in Socrates, at other Aspen seminars, and we have an obligation to take this model also and to increase its distribution so more Americans have the opportunities that we have here is what will determine the future of our republic. I hope I haven't been too earnest, but as you can see, I am just so <laughs> very grateful to Laura and Gary. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening.